good morning and welcome to another Clearwater Jazz Holiday Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Sessions. I am your guest host today, Michael Cronodal, and you're in for a treat because today's educator is Alejandro Arenas, and the topic is, in the moment, a bass player's approach to creating music with total strangers. I'm super excited about this one. I know it's going to be awesome. I just want to remind everyone as you come in, if you have any questions, if you want to make a comment, uh, you can use that chat feature there. We'll try to reserve some time at the end to answer any questions. And don't forget, if you enjoy these sessions, go over to our website at www.clearwaterjazz.com. Um, slash education and there's going to be more free sessions that's coming your way and uh, don't forget if you have questions or comments you want to let us know how much you're enjoying this email us over there at info at clearwaterjazz.com this wouldn't be possible without our uh, great sponsors uh, so please check out the studio archives of the past video sessions at clearwaterjazz.com and that's brought to you by uh, Blue Water Wealth Management at Stewart Partners and Duke Energy. And don't forget about a Young Lines podcast, and that's available wherever you stream. And that's brought to you by our friends over there at Marine Max Clearwater. Just search wherever you uh, stream. You can search Young Lines Jazz Master Virtual Sessions. So just some of the past sessions that Alejandro has given us. We had bass styles and approach to plan, swing, funk, and more. Uh, he did a session on harmony, a bass perspective, 825, and that was awesome. Uh, fun with the ranging, uh, fun, and that was a part one and two. You got to go back and check that out. And also the great What I Love About Sessions. He did one on Wilbur Ware, Oscar Pettiford, um, and the names go on and on. So he's an awesome educator. Just a little bit about him. He was born in Columbia, where he started his musical career playing flamenco and classical guitar. Uh, picked up the bass while he was in college in Bogota, and he's been performing salsa and um, all over the place. He, he was also part of his school orchestra. And during his high school years, he performed with different independent bands, his styles ranging from salsa, blues, rock, and heavy metal. Upon graduating high school, he moved to Gainesville, Florida. There he worked in freelance music while he was exposed to different genres such as reggae, jazz, and funk. And he earned his AA in music music studies from Santa Fe College, uh, Community College, where he worked unpacking books in the morning, studying during the day and playing gigs by night. He is a busy guy, but I guess, you guess what? It all worked out for him. He holds his bachelor's of music in jazz performance and a master's of music from the University of South Florida. And uh, he's, he's very busy here in the Tampa Bay area. He co-leads an award-winning group called La Lucha. So definitely check out his music, check out La Lucha. But today you get to hear from the man, the myth, the legend. So Alejandro, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. All right. <clears throat> today I'm just going to, Open my presentation here. Um, that's more fun to look at. To look at. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Let's make sure this works correctly. Okay. So today's presentation is about um, being in the moment, playing in the moment. Yeah. Uh, the a perspective to playing or creating music with total strangers um, from a bass player's perspective, right? So um, there's there's just a lot to cover here, but basically this is uh, think of this as a guide. The way I think of this is kind of like what I wish I would have known when I was starting to play music, um, because a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today I learned. Uh, through experience, through being on a stage and sharing the stage with people and really learning through mistakes and learning through just different ways to to do this. You know, there's there's um, there's so many different scenarios that you'll find yourself throughout your musical career that uh, it's kind of impossible to cover them all. But I'm kind of attempting to cover a few um, scenarios that are kind of specific and 
they kind of overlap with each other. They're not specific to just, you know, that this only happens. These are the rules for this or anything like that. You know, there's personalities involved. There's venues involved. There's a lot of things that, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, um, affect what happens. But these are kind of some guidelines that have helped me um, kind of be able to do these type of gigs um, successfully. And if you think about you know, gigging, uh, you know, I'm kind of covering ground from like, you know, doing a restaurant gig, doing a bar gig, doing a festival concert gig, uh, just doing a lot of different things. There's, there's just so many different, um, ways to, well, there's, there's a lot of different gigs, types of gigs. And, and I think all of them require you to be, prepared for them, you know, regardless of how unimportant they may seem, you know, you may be in a corner in a restaurant where nobody's paying attention to you, but um, that doesn't mean nobody is actually, there, there may be somebody in the audience that is actually <laughs> uh, worth um, playing for. I mean, every audience is worth playing for, but, you know, it may be somebody important. So you never know. In, in, in other words, just always be your best and perform at your best ability. Um, don't go on autopilot. So in any way, let's start, you know, that's kind of the, the introduction of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and briefly, I wanted to touch on the topic of improvisation. So improvisation is, what is improvisation? So I like to talk about this a little bit because uh, improvisation tends to be just a uh, kind of a mysterious term in a sense or misunderstood term in, in a lot of ways. So improvisation by definition is kind of something you create in the moment um, with no particular um, set, you know, it's just kind of like you just create it. You just, it comes out of you. And, and that's not all, it's not, that's not the case specifically with music. A lot of the times you practice, you learn to play an instrument before you improvise on it. I mean, you could be improvising while you're learning to play it. That is true as well, but l that's likely not going to go over well at a gig. So we'll talk about improvisation from the perspective of knowing how to play your instrument and improvisation specifically in jazz. So how important is it in jazz? Well, there's a lot of improvisation going on in jazz. That is true. Um, Although, like I said, a lot of it is stuff that you ha will have practiced to a certain extent. So uh, an example in this case is, let's say that you have a band that's playing a full arrangement. You know, every part of the arrangement is written. You know, may there may be some improvisation in terms of walking bass lines or the drum groove and stuff like that. But let's say that everything's written and there's a solo section where somebody gets to improvise um, over a set of chord changes so there's improvisation going there there and then you could go to the opposite side of that which is you know kind of more more an avant-garde thing where you're just completely improvising everything from the ground up there's no particular agreement on harmony rhythm or the melody of the song and everything could be improvised you know and there's great examples of people that have done that successfully um Although it wasn't always just from nothing, you know, sometimes there may have been like uh, Ornette Coleman who had a sketch of an idea and he would play it and everybody would kind of build on that. So there's that type of improvisation. But kind of what I'm going through here is that you got to know the rules to break the rules. So in other words, you are providing the context in which you're going to be able to break those rules and do and, and break new ground in a sense. So if you know the rules of how things work together, you know, if you're in a band and you're creating music with the band, most likely if you're creating music in, in a gig environment, again, you know, you could be in an avant-garde thing, but I'm not going to talk necessarily about that today, but just about knowing the rules. So you're going to have a groundwork of harmony, a tune that you're playing, and you could also be jamming on like a chord or two chords or something like that. There's still a rule there because you're, you're providing a harmony or you're providing a little groundwork. So, um, again, knowing the rules to break the rules. To me, that's a very important thing. And I think that applies to not just improvisation, that just applies to, uh, applies to music and being able to advance the music, um, if you will. So, 
regardless, you know, there's those those kind of unwritten rules. I like that term from baseball, although in baseball is not always a good term, but <laughs> and, and you know, the unwritten rules are kind of like you know, you kind of have to follow them in order to be able to successfully create create music on the spot. All right, so and improvised music. I don't think I don't know if I said this already, but improvised music doesn't just necessarily refer to jazz. Um, so be resourceful. You know, the more you know, the more you can put the information together and be resourceful. What I mean by that is that you can create ideas you know that can help with a band now and i can talk specifically about things like this or how to be resourceful but what i mean by that is kind of uh creating an arrangement on the spot or throwing some some information in there that may cause the band to to react to something that you're doing and all that so this is all based on knowledge that you may have prior and experience all right so these are a few things to keep in mind before we talk about the scenarios. Um, so no tunes, very important. Repertoire is a really extremely important part of uh, any music really, but jazz in particular, because there's music that has been played from the beginning of jazz that still that's still in the in the repertoire today. And throughout the years that jazz has been played you know it's borrowed from other genres you know it's borrowed from pop music it's borrowed from um broadway it's borrowed from a lot of different places and the list of standards just keeps growing and i'm actually going to do a class on 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 repertoire um the next one's going to be on that but you know try to learn as many tunes as you can at least listen to a lot of it um Oh, so now the next is be present and aware. So what I mean by that is that when you're on the stage, you got to be, you know, can't be texting, <laughs> just be, be part of the band, be part of, of what everybody's doing and be aware of what's going on within the band. You know, you may, you may lose, you may miss, if you're not paying attention between songs, you may, you may you know, miss a vital part of information where somebody will say like, hey, we're going to end it like this. And if you miss it, well, then you're going to miss the ending too. So be there, right? And aware. Um, know your place on and off the stage. Again, this some of these will make more sense once you see the scenarios I'm painting, but I think this goes across the, the, the you know, the spectrum of being a musician. Um, you know, if you're a hired gun or if you're a sideman, you are going to be a sideman. You're not uh, necessarily featured unless you're told you're being featured and all of that stuff. Um, and also you may find yourself in a situation where you are, I'll, I'll talk about this, but like you're subbing for somebody. So it's not your gig, you're subbing for somebody. So you're kind of representing that person that's not there. So whatever you do off the stage, you know, make sure it, it, it represents you well. <laughs> don't, don't push the boundaries of what you can do. Uh, you know, read the room, you know, I use this term, uh, kind of like, you know, being aware of your surroundings and you just don't do anything stupid, basically. <laughs> uh, be respectful. This goes along with that. You know, um, sometimes you may find personalities that be, that can be a little bit abrasive, if you will, um, you know, that doesn't always mean that, that they mean wrong or anything like that. Sometimes people in the heat of, of the intensity of the music may not, uh, communicate particularly well, uh, if you're on a stage and you're trying to cue something on somebody and somebody's not paying attention, or, you know, sometimes it's just, people just have certain things. I've been, I've been told sometimes I give the stink eye, um, to people, but, I have not, that's not what I, you know, I just have a, a bad concentration face, I guess. Um, but being respectful all around, whether you are a sideman or whether you're a leader, I think it's very important to keep in mind. Um, and learn from your and others' mistakes. Uh, I don't know if that's written correctly, yours and others' mistakes. But basically, you know, when you go to a gig and you fail miserably at something or, you know, you just didn't do as well, Make notes, take notes, and and be aware that next time you're gonna fix those mistakes. Um, and if you see, if you're on the band and you see somebody make the mistake that you could have made, or let's say that you as a leader didn't didn't communicate something, then um, 
keep that in mind as well. I think being aware that, that things can always improve um, or you can always improve, uh, it's good. It's important to grow as a musician and as a person, of course. So, all right. So these are things that just apply to everything that I'm going to talk to about. I'm going to talk about next. So these are a few of the possible situations or scenarios that you might find yourself uh, in when playing music. So first one, and I'm going to get in depth on, on, on some of these. So I just wanted to put them here so you can see them subbing for the bassist in an established band. Again, we're kind of talking from the bass player's perspective, but some of this can apply to other instrumentalists as well. Uh, being part of a um, pickup band or a house band, working in a one-time non-established band. So first time a few people play together. Um, and I'm, I'm talking specifically about gigs, not necessarily like rehearsals, you know, uh, side reading gigs and leading a band. So I'll talk about all of these individually. And again, some of some things are gonna overlap through these. So first scenario, solving in an established band. So in this situation, there will likely be some material that exists already. If you're coming in to play with a band that's already been playing together for a while. So the, in the best case scenario, you will be given time to prepare and the, the band will hopefully provide you with charts and or recordings. Um, if that is the case, then you should learn that material as best as you can. Um, you know, if you are not provided with those things, but the band has some existing material that you can access on your own, do your homework. So go and check it out. Go and, and see what you can find. Find as much information as you can before getting on that stage with that band, especially if you don't have a chance to have a rehearsal with them. Like I said, best case scenario, you might have a, you know, a heads up and you'll have a rehearsal and then you go do the gig. But, you know, you may find yourself in a situation when you're a last minute sub, um, you know, Bass player got sick, uh, double booked himself, something happened. So you come in at the last minute. So in this case, I think it's very important to identify who is leading the band and will be helping you navigate the gig. You know, I, in these situations, I like to look at the drummer for like rhythmic uh, cues. Uh, I like to look at the maybe the pianist for endings or, you know, the, the singer maybe if there's a singer, they may be cueing something. Um, so if there is a chart, if there are charts that you're side reading, you know, I'll talk about this more specifically, but, you know, or, or if you have a chance to prepare, going back to being able to have the time to prepare, but to prepare. So take notes, identify tricky sections in the music and focus on being able to play your part with the same conviction as the regular bassist would. Right. That's the hardest thing about subbing is that people are used to having a specific personality, a specific guy playing specific things there or guy or, or girl or whatever, you know, a person <laughs> to that's there playing, playing that music. Um, and it's tricky. It's tricky to play in, in an established band and have somebody that doesn't play the same as the other person. But I think uh, the important thing should be to prioritize making the music sound good. What I mean by this is that you don't maybe don't take too many liberties. You know, if you're playing the gig, just kind of play the gig first and see, <clears throat> see how far you can, you know, basically read or ask or see how the band sees if you, if you, if, you know, if, if they're cool with you opening up and putting more of your signature in there or anything like that. But I think kind of making the music sound good and how it usually sounds is most important. Again, this is kind of a, an ethereal concept because it depends on, on the band, on, on the situation and all of that stuff. And, and of course, if you're just kind of sight reading and, and just jumping in at the, at the last minute, um, you know, it, it's, it can be tricky, but it can be done. And again, a lot of that is just communication. Look around, look for cues, look for, um, you know, be there and be aware, like I said earlier. Um, <clears throat> so 
that's this is a situation that can happen when you're solving in an established band. Um, so let's talk about another scenario or situation. Um, being part of a pickup or pickup band or a house band. So this one, um, you know, I've, I've found myself in this situation uh, a number of times. And, you know, a lot of the times you have touring artists that sometimes may not be able to travel with their own band. Um, so they'll hire local musicians to play the dates where, well, they're in a specific region. Um, the best case scenario, you know, if the if you're in a pickup band, um, you'll end up with good players that you already know from the scene, and that makes the gig a lot easier because you're not playing with. There's only one stranger in that stage, which would be the band leader, or you know, or leaders. You know, sometimes it's two people that hire a full rhythm section or anything like that. Well, so knowing the knowing at least some of the musicians that you're playing with obviously helps the situation. Um, but one thing I would suggest in this, again, some of this stuff applies too. Best case scenario, you'll be given plenty of time to prepare and you'll be sent charts and recordings. That doesn't always happen. So this goes along with doing your homework on your own. So check out the leader's music prior to the gig. You know, check out any recordings, any stuff that you played that you know that's that's out there. You know, there's a lot of YouTube videos you can probably check out these days and all of that um ask the right questions if there's something in the music the you know if, if you're if you've sent if you are sent a chart and you have certain doubts as to how you things that are there or anything like that just be feel free to ask the question you know i'm sure the band leader is going to be happy that you are concerned about playing the music right um and there may be mistakes in charts you know, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, also the right questions may be in a situation such as, let's say that you are, instead of having like prepared time, they just say like, oh, we'll just call some standards. We'll just call some tunes on the stage. So then at this point, you what you have to know is, okay, what tunes are we playing? Um, what should I be aware of? So let's say, for example, that you somebody calls well think about standards so there's you know a lot of standards just kind of you just play the form there's no specific arrangement arrangements but there's a lot of other standards that actually have specific arrangements some of them are based on famous recordings some of them are just kind of agreements that people you know kind of like um head arrangements or or or, or ways to play the tunes that are just kind of done a specific way so uh, an example of that is all the things you are i'll play a little snippet of that so you can hear so this intro um, is played very often and all the things you are but not everybody plays it so i'll play a little bit of it So, you know, that's an intro that every time somebody calls that tune, I'll ask, do you want intro or no intro? You know, especially as a bass player, I'm playing the melody in that. So along with the pianos or or if there's no pianos, then it's it's me. <laughs> so, um, you know, so l ask for specific. Of course, the more material, you know, the easier it is going to be to ask the right questions. You know, if you find yourself uh you know, playing tunes like Take the A Train, there's also an intro there. Um, you know, there's rhythmic hits that are part of the melody, um, like Doxy, for example, or specific bass lines like, you know, all blues, you know, play a little bit of that. Right, two things there the bass line and also the piano part the piano part you know it's also kind of an important thing of it you're kind of recreating that arrangement that's what some people might want to do so kind of 
as you go through playing with more people, you'll realize there's certain tunes that are played a certain way, but not everybody plays in that way. So it's okay to ask, hey, you know, do you do the intro on this or what do you know what whose version do you play of this? Um, you could take uh, Miles Davis playing Bye Bye Blackbird. Uh, there's a little intro on that. Not a lot of people play it, but some people might want to play it. Um, so hence another important way of learning a tunes not from the real book um because not all of that information is there sometimes but i'll talk about that later in another class um okay so of course be professional be pre you know this this includes a lot of things that i've already said be prepared do your homework and all that stuff but you're on a stage you know look good be ready to sound good and you know be a team player i misspelled this sorry here I just see it it says be part a team player that is not what i meant to write i think i was going to write be part of the team but then i changed it to be a team player and i didn't change it correctly so in any case <laughs> um th basically what that means is that you know you don't want to just be like trying to impress the band leader with your individual playing. You know, you are a bass player, so you're actually part of the rhythm section. You are a supportive instrument, first and foremost. So if you, let's say that you're not agreeing with the drummer on something and you're like, well, I'm going to do my thing and, you know, screw that guy. Well, it's not going to go very well for everybody on the gig because, you know, you're not playing together. You know, you are just playing for yourself and trying to maybe impress the band leader or just trying to save yourself in a, from, from a bad situation, a potentially bad situation. So, you know, just be aware of that. Um, I'll use an example, a real life example of, um, um, of a situation, not, not the situation of the not playing together, but of being a pickup or a house band. There's two specific situations I can talk about. Uh, we did the Sarasota Jazz Festival with my band La Lucha. We were the house band for that. And we were backing uh, Randy Brecker, Ken Poplowski, Houston Person, um, a lot of it, Dick Hyman, a, a lot of people that are just incredible musicians and also very different musicians. So, for example, um, well, Ken was the, the Ken Piplowski, great clarinetist, was the musical director for that. And he basically just said, like, here's a good book of standards that have good changes, you know, have this ready, you know, if you want to print it out or put it on an iPad, you know, most likely if there's something that's called that you don't know, it'll be on this book. So that was really cool of him because he is aware that we are not going to know every song ever written. You know, if we're playing with Houston person who's 85 years old and has, you know, a lot of years of repertoire that he has learned on us, you know, we're a young band, you know, we're still learning repertoire. So you know, he was very cool with that understanding. Hey, you know, I understand you guys don't know every song ever written. So let's make it easy and have this as a standard thing that we can all use. Uh, Houston actually ended up having his own lead sheets because he plays a lot of stand a lot of songs that are not standards. Um, but that that was that was yeah, then, you know, it was playing with Randy Brecker. So we were kind of saying like, oh, is Randy going to play like some of the Brecker Brothers stuff, like more modern stuff or, you know, and he just basically just got on the stage and said like, hey, let's play Have You Met Miss Jones, you know, just a standard, no intro, no anything. He just said, start right on it, you know, well, fake the ending, you know, and endings, you know, that's, there's a, again, I'll talk about this in the repertoire class, but, you know, there's, there's, certain endings that are kind of part of this part of the the jazz repertoire that you just play that are kind of agreed upon so listen for those things you know uh, a lot of times you kind of have to anticipate you know but that's how the gig was with randy brecker he just called a few standards on the stage uh for that specific gig we had like a really short sound check you know some people wanted to play the entire tune some people just wanted to do 
the head of the tune, not, ev not even improvised or anything. Everybody was a little bit different, but everybody, everybody was nice. And luckily we were prepared for any of those situations. And then there's also the jam session situation where you are just playing with a combination of people that are rotating constantly. Sometimes, you know, as a bass player, I always find, you know, at least in this area, there's not a lot of bass players that show up to the jam session. So I end up playing with a bunch of different people throughout the night. And, um, you know, basically you just have to keep things professional. You know, there's different levels of players. There's people that don't communicate as well what they want to do. Um, but you gotta you gotta keep it together. You gotta you gotta be that glue that keeps things um, happening. You know, so that means I'm gonna have to. You know, if if there's a drummer that's kind of struggling a little bit with something, sometimes you get drummers that um, haven't played in a while or they're uncomfortable with the drum set that they're playing on. All these things, I try to be supportive, not necessarily. You know, I want to make sure that the that not everything just falls apart. You know. Um, I'm listening for the chord changes that the pianist that's sitting in may be playing to, you know. So as a bass player, you kind of in a particular situation where you kind of have to follow but also lead at the same time. So again, knowing a lot of tunes and and really trying to be as solid with your start with your time as possible is a very good way. And you know, listening ears ears all the time. All right, let's talk about the next scenario. Uh, playing in a non-established band. So when can this happen? Um, let's say that a bunch of subs just end up coming together in a band. It, it's happened before where, um, you know, I show up to the gig expecting to play with the two other guys. Let's say that it's a trio, two other guys that are there regularly. It turns out neither one of them is there and everybody's a sub on the gig. All right. Well, that's fine. That's That can be a really really fun gig if everybody has the right attitude and you know so what i would say on that is be ready to contribute so keep a list of tunes handy that you feel comfortable playing um that you know are part of the standard repertoire too um so you know keep it in your back pocket literally in your back pocket or on your phone or or whatever you know um but that helps because you already find some common ground that the band knows together, the musicians may know together, and then it's going to minimize that time between songs because in any place that you're playing, you don't want that necessarily to happen. Um, lead if necessary, you know, if nobody's kind of, if everybody's kind of looking at you to lead, well, be ready to lead, you know. I know as bass players, it, it can be tricky sometimes, but, but you know, be ready to kind of sit on the saddle and, and drive things forward and, and make something happen. Um, you know, I mentioned find common repertoire. That's part of the contributing and having a list of songs. But, you know, I think if you end up kind of leading, I think, or you can suggest this like, oh, why don't we all call one? Do, why don't we each call a tune as we go through these things? Right. Uh, sometimes somebody may be feeling adventurous enough that say like, hey, let's make something completely up. Of course, Again, in that case, you just got to be open-minded in order to do something like that, you know. And, you know, I think all of this boils down to the right attitude. Um, you know, if you have the right attitude, you can potentially turn a really, a potentially bad gig to a very fun one. Um, so, you know, those are just things to keep in mind when you are with complete strangers in, in a stage and, and nobody really is supposed to be in charge, you know, be ready to be possibly in charge uh, if that's the case, but don't be overbearing either, you know. And again, a lot of these things more than musically are more about attitude and, and kind of the way you approach things, you know. Um, but let's talk a little bit now about sight reading gigs. So the most obvious and more complex example of this is a big band gig. And let's talk specifically about that. You know, this can apply to smaller, smaller bands as well, where you're sight reading, but you know, usually the larger the ensemble, the more stuff written out you need in order to keep it all together, right. To actually utilize the ensemble. So of course this goes without saying, learn to read music well. That's an obvious thing. If you don't put emphasis on that, 
you're missing out on a lot of potential gigs. You know, there's there's a lot of side reading gigs out there that are not particularly don't have to be hard, you know, just having good a good reading ability is good, you know, especially as a bass player, a lot of times you you may get a specific written bass line, you know, and this is talking mostly about jazz, but sometimes you just get chords and certain rhythms that you need to catch. Um, or not catch, but to play with the band. I shouldn't use the term catch. Um, so in this case, let's talk again, a big band, time is of the essence. Um, what I mean by that is that the larger the ensemble, the more time issues may arise because, you know, it gets heavier, the sound is bigger. Uh, maybe you have a trombone section that's trying to read a complicated uh, eight node line, you know, or 60 node line, and they may be dragging. So you need to be there in order to keep it moving forward. You and the drummer, you know. Um, there was a great analogy that uh, a great lead player, um, I think she was the, the, the lead trumpet player in the in one of the army bands, I don't recall her name, she did a master class at USF, but uh, <clears throat> it's funny, she said this, you know, this is not my opinion, but she said this, like, a lot of the times playing in a big band for a rhythm section can feel like driving a bus and everybody's putting stuff, like, all the horn players are, like, putting stuff out the window in order to slow the bus down, <laughs> and, you know, that was what she said she's a horn player i'm not gonna get into any any i'm not blaming anybody but you know a large ensemble can have more time issues just because of the nature of what it is especially if everybody's side reading you know um because everybody's listening to each other speaking of that playing in tune is very important because the horn players are going to be listening for a foundational note a root right which the bass player is usually providing so for them to play in tune with each other, you know, if you have like voicings that are complicated, you're going to really need the band to be in tune and provide, you know, having a bass player that's playing in tune and providing that good foundation is really important. Um, scan the music. So this is more kind of a sight reading, um, sight reading approach. So look at the music before you start playing it specifically for maybe some hard passages you know like if you have some unison lines or you know things specifically on the bass like eight note lines that you may not be playing that often um especially if they come out of nowhere after a bunch of chords and also more specifically look for codas or tricky repeats um where you may be you may get lost <laughs> it can happen it will happen so try to catch that because sometimes you know obviously watch the leader for that you know for all of these things for cues uh clue you know cues and and of course count offs all this different stuff um so don't bur don't bury your head in the music either you need to be aware of everything that's going on around but this kind of comes you know, the coda thing that I was mentioning goes along with being ready for less than ideal charts. A lot of the times, an issue I find very often is actually um, finding legible charts sometimes. There's a lot of chicken scratch charts that are produced very quickly. Uh, sometimes it's computer generated charts that are not particularly well edited. So ties are funky or, or you know, there's things that don't work always well. Uh, they're poorly spaced, like you can't really see the phrases. I don't, you know, I particularly like to, to, to be able to visualize a phrase in one system if possible, you know, or, you know, I hate having like, a four bar phrase and then have three bars and then one bar in the beginning of this and then you know everything gets off but you, you gotta get used to being able to read that type of stuff and also i find a lot of charts that have notes out of range um so you know they'll have a nice low d that i cannot play on my uh four string bass so <laughs> Be ready to find stuff like that and be ready to kind of deal with it in the moment. Again, your ears and of, of course your reading abilities, but your ears may also be your savior in situations like this. Uh, because most of the time you'll be able to hear, okay, if, 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 if it's a walking baseline, for example, you'll be able to kind of hear where things are going. Um, 
so be aware of all those things i mean that that's uh that's you know there's a lot of side reading gigs out there uh some of them have classic arrangements too you know that if you familiarize yourself with those arrangements there's a lot of sinatra stuff uh especially with singers right um you know a lot of the rat pack you know dean martin frank sinatra stuff uh, more modern stuff like michael buble charts and things like that it's good to acquaint yourself uh because then you go to a gig and you've already at least heard the tune uh before so that makes it easier for everybody involved um all right the last scenario i wanted to present here is leading a band so let's say that you're hiring a bunch of strangers to play with you so you are responsible all responsibility is on you and that means a lot because that the a lot of the success on the gig depends on how organized you are you know so you want to make the best of the situation by making things easy for the rest of, easier or easy for the rest of the band so that means let's say if you have charts make sure they're properly organized taped and hopefully mistake free um you know if somebody if you're at a gig and somebody tells you hey man there's a there's a wrong note here or something like that try to try to make a note of going and fixing it sometimes it's not always easy i have been guilty of not having particularly updated charts um you know it's happened to us with la lucha with my band that we initially had a chart then we started playing um the music and the music grew in there and we started adding stuff that never made it onto the chart so then we hire a sax player let's say to play with us at a gig or a trumpet player um and then we realized that the chart of an arrangement we've been playing for four years has never been updated so uh you know it's it's always we always try to be aware of that of trying to keep it updated and say okay let's let's you know because it's happened before again we learn from our mistakes we try to learn from our mistakes but um you know i think another important thing is to communicate your philosophy on what the gig is what i mean by this that i've been in a lot of gigs where um people are very open the band leader is just there to be kind of part of the band to be like hey let's let's all give what we can give give who we are what we what we do and what i mean by that is i like, open up you know make up a make up an intro or you know make up an ending or you set up the tempo on this tune stuff like that that's not necessarily related to him leading the band um on a specific musical way but then you also have people that want a very specific sound so they will tell you hey i want you to do this or just play the music just you know don't stick from that i've played with piano players i've mentioned this in a few classes where there's some piano players that ju they just don't want me to play any chord changes that are not their chord changes you know there but then i have all played with also piano players who if i suggest an alteration uh, uh substitution or anything like that a different chord progression they'll all they're all for it um so i think kind of being able to communicate that with your bandmates or the people that you're hiring uh it's important because it, it lets you know where you stand i know for me knowing that knowing the philosophy kind of of how a, a person is going to approach the gig is going to help me play better because i can do either one i can play the role you know the specific role or i can open up and and be much more creative and and do that in my own way so knowing which is which is is it's a lot easier because it's good you know first i'm not going to be second guessing to see how far i can push the leader on the group or um you know it can also help me just make better decisions musically and be more um uh what's the word i'm looking for um just be more confident about your playing and how what the what the gig calls for so i think communicating that is good now you know like for example um oh and also things like does the gig call for low volume you know uh do we need to keep it quiet you know uh well you know 
are you going to be calling all the tunes or, or are you going to let other people choose tunes that they feel comfortable playing? You know, now that being said, I think in some cases, oops, sorry, I just skipped here. Um, so, uh, in some cases, it's important to maybe wait a set, lead a set the way you want to lead it and see how much you can, how much liberty you want to give the musicians. If they're there, if, if, you're, if you're feeling something like, oh, this drummer wants to say more or this pianist wants to say more or, you know, and they're able to say more, to contribute positively in a way that you are happy as a leader, then I think that's okay to communicate that. And But yes, maybe listen to them if you don't know them well before you make any decisions outside your comfort zone. Again, you know, you may be of the mindset of like, let's all just be ourselves from the very beginning of the gig. That's perfectly fine. I think it's good to communicate that. Um, and most importantly, treat others the way you want to be treated. Again, a lot of this stuff is about attitude, about creating a positive environment in the bandstand. Um, you know, some people grew up in, in the more hard-nosed or like kind of the more like dog eats dog type of environment where you know if you did something wrong in the bands then you were gonna hear about it right there and then um and you know that works for some people uh everybody acts differently but i think you know keeping things professional on the stage um you know i think as a society we've we've things are different in terms of how what's acceptable what's not acceptable and i think it's good to be aware of that you know nobody nobody really wants to be made an example on the stage um you can talk about things that can be better for sure but you know i think it's good to keep in mind that we're dealing with humans who may not be in a good place mentally at a given point or may feel intimidated by something you're doing that you don't realize you're doing aka um the stink eye story i told at the beginning all right so again those are some scenarios that are just very you know they they can just vary considerably there's a lot of things that that can happen from there um so just keep in mind a lot i know this is a lot of kind of information but i think it's it's good advice you know if you're if you're going to a gig and going to again this is advice that i would have loved to have heard when i was first starting to play um and you know this leads me through the conclusions basically uh, something that i try to do before i had enough gigs to gain experience was was gain experience was to anticipate these types of uh, types of scenarios of course i wasn't aware of all of them but kind of thinking sometimes ahead you know this kind of goes along with practice practice being on the gig you know many times i would practice in a way of saying like okay what happens if the if they ask me to modulate uh three courses later you know can i do that so you know when i was practicing i would i would practice doing that I would kind of really put myself in hypothetical situations of saying, oh yeah, let's say what what happens if I'm playing, you know, this really up tempo tune and you know I am asked to solo on it. So then well I'm gonna practice having at least something more or less worked out. Um so that I don't crash and burn if I'm barely keeping up with the tempo, you know. Um because that can happen. Sometimes they'll just say, Oh yeah, bass solo, I'm like, okay, well there's there there's that also that's that was the other thing like what if i what if somebody calls something really really fast so what i would do is practice with a metronome at an unhealthy speed <laughs> and really see try to keep up with it you know try to keep up with with good time and everything just practice stamina um uh i remember um um I'm forgetting his name, trombone player who did a master class at uh, um, at USF did that with us. Who said like, "Oh, let's test your stamina. <laughs> if I call this up tempo tune, you know, let's see, you know, if you guys are dragging, I'm gonna stop you." So, and he did this. It was like a, a workshop, basically saying, you know, make sure your the time is there. Um, so yeah, kind of kind of thinking of different scenarios where you uh might find yourself struggling 
you know that that was the th the thing for me like kind of like the the approach is not to be surprised if it happens to kind of like you've been there mentally before and i think that's very important you know kind of picturing yourself in that situation and 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 anticipating okay this is how i would deal with this if it happens i've i've you know mentally i've prepared myself to being yelled at at gigs i have been lucky that i have not been yelled at but you know, I sometimes just prepared myself mentally to be in a really bad situation at a gig, you know, for whatever reason. And, you know, at least it didn't surprise me, you know, like at least it didn't, it, it, it's one of those situations where, you know, um, if you are there mentally before you're there physically, it helps you kind of know maybe what's coming, you know, at least that works for me. And that may be something to keep in mind when you are preparing you know, for your music career. Um, communication is very important. I cannot stress that just as important as listening. <laughs> if you are unhappy with something, you know, as a leader, it's okay to communicate with somebody to make sure they fix it or, you know, or if you are presenting something that you want to have a certain quality, that's perfectly fine to talk about it and just, just make sure that it happens. Again, if you find yourself as a sideman creating music, asking, it's like, hey, you know, I felt, I felt like, you know, maybe I wasn't playing this right, or maybe, oh man, did you, you know, do, do you want me to be more, you know, more open, or do you want me to be, you know, you know, is my volume okay? It's, you know, certain things that if you're kind of second guessing yourself about certain things, I think it's, it's okay to ask and not assume, you know, just communicate, I think. And you also open a line of, of connection with other people. I'm not a terribly social person, but, you know, at least letting the person that's hiring me know that I am aware or I am willing to change or improve what I'm doing at that moment I think it's important. Again, people communicate in very different ways. Sometimes you think somebody's giving you the stink eye and it's not. So, and sometimes people may not say anything at all. They may be incredibly unhappy with you. So who knows? You know, again, people are people. <laughs> but I think opening up those lines of communication is very important. Uh, be prepared as much as you can. Like I said, sometimes if you, if there's, ex if there are existing recordings that you can check out, do that, you know, even if you do more than you're asked for, basically, go out of your way to be as prepared as possible. This is another scenario that I try to do. Like, I would find the hardest arrangement that I could find of a certain person and be like, okay, you know, if I have to side read this chart, let's see, you know, I wouldn't necessarily memorize it, but at least be able to kind of tell what's going on. Um, and again, be open-minded. I've talked about this throughout the whole thing. Uh, but sometimes people may, be, may do things differently than you would. And you may find yourself either annoyed or bored or anything like that. But you're going to have to accept what it is at the moment if you want to be creating successful uh, music successfully. So, uh, you know. Being open-minded comes with a lot of different things, but, um, and always have a good attitude. That's most important. Make a positive environment for everybody. Make, make everybody have fun. Make everybody just, uh, I don't know, just have fun playing music. That's why we do this, you know? So that's, I'll leave it at that. I think that's a good way to finish. Just have fun. Practice, prepare as much as you can, and, you know, just just continue creating and, you know, growing and learning. Well, Alejandro, you know what? I think this conversation needs to be had with all up-and-coming musicians. I mean, even at the middle school, high school level, and it would help their career so, so much. And one big thing I noticed uh, that you stressed was communication, mm -hmm. communication, whether you're on the stage. And I even like to stress communication off the stage as well, which yes. showing up on time, wearing the right thing. <laughs> Imagine somebody had to fill in for you and your group 
and you know everybody has dress blacks on and they come in with shorts and sandals yep <laughs> and i know that's not quite as much music related but it's a total package when it comes to performing um but yeah communication i love the way you brought that home as well as just knowing charts but having a great attitude um so tell me this, uh, we had a question coming in. What was one of your best experiences as far as performing with some people you did not know, you didn't know what you was walking into? Do you have one that's like, it stand out like this was your best experience ever uh, that you really, really enjoyed it? You know, it wasn't all strangers. I think it must have been, I mentioned the Sarasota Jazz Festival and that was just a really incredible experience um because it was you know I, I mean i was playing i was you know the house band was were two of my best friends you know mark and john from la lucha but at the same time we're backing all these musicians that we literally just met and they're not just they're amazing musicians they're world-class musicians so um to be able to kind of step up there and say, you know, having them trust you, first of all, to say, yeah, we're all in this together. We're team players. We're doing this together and, and let's let's make it happen. To me, that was a really cool experience, you know, like standing next to Randy Brecker and the stage was kind of tight. So I had to literally stand right next to him and standing next to Randy Brecker and, you know, playing with him just creating music out of the blue with him was just an incredible experience you know and of course having knowing that i can turn to the drums and there's mark you know and turn to the piano and there's john uh adds a layer of comfort of course but i think that was a case where we 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 weren't even we weren't even like communicating. I, I know throughout that festival, you know, there was a, a, a moment where I played with Mary Stallings and it was um, um, Shelley Berg, the wonderful pianist uh, on piano and Mark was playing drums, but so, you know, half the band was, I think Houston person was sitting it. So, so sitting in it and just being able to be part of that, you know, like, I think it was one of those moments that, you know, I was starstruck for a few minutes and then I realized, oh, I am on the stage with these people creating the same music and I am just as important as they are to creating this music. So we're, it, this is not the time to be starstruck and think like, oh, I'm a lesser musician or anything like that. It's just, hey, this is where we are. Let's make this music together and let's make it happen. You know, so I, it was beautiful because everybody was just in that same vibe. You know, nobody made us feel like the newcomers or anything like that. You know, these well, well-traveled musicians that have been in the scene for over 50 years were all extremely welcoming, extremely encouraging, and just a pleasure to play with, you know, and you know that's the most recent experience that i can think that that you know or the, the most remarkable experience that i can think um right off the top of my head there's been a few other ones where you, know, you just find a group of people that you've never played with and you just immediately start gelling um you know um there's a there's a few uh people in town that i that i've had that experience with that um where it just things just kind of clicked right off the bat and it's beautiful to feel that because you know they also tend to be very cool people to hang out with you know they tend to be you know um i play a lot with um with a wonderful singer or singer ona cure who just moved here from barcelona recently and we have a very cool connection we do bass and vocals but we have a lot a really cool musical and personal connection um that you know it's those things are kind of hard to to come by you know you can practice with people for a long time but just having that report right off the bat is really uh kind of priceless and you know to be able to get on a station just create that out of the blue is, is just kind of otherworldly to a certain extent well yeah that sounds like an awesome experience and i know every musician that's listening 
as their own experience that uh, they probably remember with this. So that's powerful. Um, you know what? We really appreciate this uh, session today, and I know it's going to benefit so many people. And if you're listening and you're saying, wow, this is amazing information, please go tell other people to join in on these awesome sessions. You go back into our archives, uh, go to our website, www.clearwaterjazz.com slash education, and check out all these great sessions. Alejandro has given us plenty of great sessions that we can listen to. And uh, just share and tell everybody to come here and, uh, and learn. And most of all, let's go out and let's play and let's jam and let's keep this music alive because it is alive and well. And it's the mm -hmm. foundation of what we love here at Clearwater Jazz Holiday. So we want to thank you for tuning in today. And uh, we hope to see you out there soon. So keep it swinging, everyone. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.